other than my hometown Seoul, uh, I have three uh, favorite cities uh, around the world. Uh, uh, Sydney is obviously one of them. The other two being Hong Kong and Vancouver. Uh, so it's so nice to be back in uh, uh, Sydney. Um, and for that, I'd like to thank the uh, China Studies Center and Olivier and Jing Dong. And also so nice to see uh, 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 an old friend Hans uh, from the mid 1990s. Oh, yes. And then um, I'm a member of APPP, Anti-PowerPoint Party. So you don't see the screen. Um, but I think, as Jing Dong uh, mentioned, the previous session uh, set the stage very nicely uh, for my talk. Uh, this talk was originally prepared for a, a World Chinese Economic Forum that was supposed to be held in Hangzhou. Uh, and the session I was assigned to uh, give a talk to uh, uh, was entitled the, uh, the Conditions for the Pax Sinica. But then, of course, they, 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 they did an excellent job uh, of organizing the whole conference. Uh, even utilizing a very uh, capable public relations company uh, and they prepared for like six months before the conference. But then two months before the conference they sent me an email. Uh, there was a consultation with the government officials and the title didn't really suit the, the current period. Pax Sinica didn't really, you know, uh, sound nice under the US-China trade dispute and so on. So the session was cancelled. So this is my first time using this script to uh, give a talk. Uh, so uh, I will use just 40 minutes, uh, and then I will uh, use the remaining time, I don't know, maybe 20, 25 minutes for Q&A and, and further discussions. A little over two decades ago, that's probably uh, late 1990s, uh, Chinese academics and police experts began to talk about uh, a new discourse uh, centered around a responsible great power, Fu Zhiren the Da Guo. Of course, they were much encouraged by China's continued high-powered economic growth since the early 1980s, and catalyzed in significant part by the plunge of East Asia into a very serious uh, financial crisis. Um, these ex Chinese experts and scholars touted China as a great power with responsibilities for stabilizing, if not rescuing, uh, East Asia by way of not depreciating the renminbi and further promoting uh, intra-regional trade. Back then, however, China was only a regional power with a regional presence. With the uninterrupted, uh, though gradually slowing, levels of economic development and the manifestation of China's growing power in many key domains, the rise of China captured the world's uh, increasing attention throughout the 2000s. China's economic power surpassed other powers one by one during the decade of 2000. First, Italy, France, UK, and Germany. The remarkable catch-up culminated in 2010 when the GDP of China finally uh, surpassed that of Japan, landing China in the world's second largest economy. Um, at about the same time, and perhaps in my view rather prematurely, China embarked on an unexpected path of demonstrating her power in the East China Sea and the South China Sea, stirring up intense debates on the emergence of a newly assertive China. Uh, back then, let's say between 2010 and 2014, there were intense debates uh, regarding whether China has really become assertive and whether that assertive is new in nature, in other words, different, any different from China's uh, assertiveness before 2010. And for instance, Alistair in Johnston at Harvard had a serious debate with Mike Swain at the Carnegie Endowment uh, for International Peace. Uh, 
and there were several articles published in International Security, which is a very uh, famous uh, journal in the field. Uh, so the debates were really intense. By 2014, however, the debate was sort of subdued, um, as if there was no debate. If you look at the International Relations Journal these days, you don't really find any article devoted wholly to the issue of China's assertiveness. Why? Because scholars and experts now take for granted the fact that China has indeed become assertive since, well, of course, the cut point might be different depending on the author, but since 2010 and definitely since 2013. Let me give you a, a, an indicator, a very important indicator. Um, China's foreign relations were based upon uh, three important principles. Okay. One, not assuming the leadership, either of the region or of the world. In Chinese, they call it 不当头. Okay. Second principle is not seeking hegemony, 不争霸. And the third principle is not expanding into other territories, 不搞扩张. Of these three principles of China's foreign relations, the first one has gone missing since 2014. The first principle of 不当头 is no longer evoked by the Chinese government. Why? Because just like the scholars and experts, I think Chinese government is also taking for granted the fact that China has become a leader now. Not the leader, but a leader. Okay. China uh, is now also imposing, uh, willing to impose higher cost on other countries who stand against her preferences, whether it be Great Britain, uh, France, Norway, Japan, South Korea, Sweden, Mongolia, the Philippines, Canada, Singapore, or Palau. Okay. China also officially engages in a more proactive diplomacy with concrete efforts to turn Beijing into a center of global diplomacy. Uh, official jargon for this is the uh, Zhuchang Jiao, So China becoming the center of global diplomacy. And as stipulated by the, uh, the decisions uh, meted out by the fourth plenum, which recently, uh, was recently convened, China also talks about the Chinese way of dealing with many things, particularly the governance issues. Okay, so they call it Zhongguo Fangan, okay, which could and should be different from the Western approaches to uh, these different problems. The Belt and Road Initiative we, we already talked about in, in one of the uh, previous sessions, the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, and CRA, which is Contingency Reserve Arrangement within the framework of uh, BRICS, are just a few examples of Beijing's proactive diplomacy. What, is, what makes China different now compared to uh, 1997 when the discourse of responsible great power first emerged is China is no longer a regional power uh, anymore. China is now a global power with global ambitions, if not yet with full global presence, but near global presence, I would say. Uh, China's new aliases like G2 global stakeholder, strategic competitor, and hegemonic candidate no longer ring hollow as they did 10 years ago. A plethora of announcements, assessments, and policies specifically targeting China, meted out by the Trump administration, is a powerful testimony to China's much elevated status in the international system. But there is a puzzle here. In retrospect, it is rather puzzling why China's rise has caught the world's attention so early. China's GDP is now only 70% of America's. Okay? But the world is already preoccupied with hegemonic war, hegemonic competition, the two-city death trap, and so on and so forth. Okay? 
let's go back to 1872. Does anyone know what happened in 1872? 1872 it was a very significant year because that was when the GDP of the United States finally surpassed that of the UK. And that was reported widely in British newspapers. They all know, knew about it. Okay? But after 72 years from 1872, that was 1944, at the Bretonnes, UK had to cede hegemony to the United States. Okay? So it took 72 years. Now, China only accounts for 70% of America's GDP, but the world is already paying so much attention to China. The reason, I would say, is a shadow of history. America only emerged once as a great power, but China has done it quite a few times. Tang, Ming, <coughs> Qing, excluding the Yuan. Okay? So many people probably take for granted that China will become a great power, China will, be, will become an empire. And I think other, other than that, I'm, I cannot really explain why people are so much preoccupied with this uh, prematurely, while underestimating uh, the rest of the world. Okay. Pundits around the world scratch their heads, uh, wondering, when and how China is going to compete with the U.S. mano a mano. Okay? The crux of the matter is that Beijing is already a full-size competitor on a global scale, as evidenced by the literal tones of America's policy documents designed to contain or constrain China. The Trump administration explicitly defines China as a revisionist force and predatory economics on par with Russia, and prescribes a whole of government and whole of society approach against China. A myriad of measures already meted out by the US government, ranging from high trap imposition, the Foreign Investment Risk Review Modernization Act, a firma, the US-Mexico-Canada agreement, particularly the non-market economy clause in it, uh, Indo-Pacific strategy, Taiwan Travel Act, Tibet Reciprocal Access Act, the Asia Reassurance Initiative Act, abbreviated ARIA, um, as well as the tightening of surveillance over Chinese students, researchers, and the Confucius Institutes in America. All of these underscore the point. Now let me move on to the main topic, having, having laid out the backgrounds. So will China's challenges to the United States be sustainable in the medium to uh, long run? The answer to, to this question rests on, obviously, five hurdles situated on Beijing's uh, uncertain path to a responsible great power. Here, the question applies to both adjectives of great and responsible. China obviously doesn't want itself to stop being at the middle power. It wants to become a great power. And at the same time, the world doesn't want to see an irresponsible China. So where is, going, where is the overlap going to happen? Okay. Let me first talk about the first hurdle that is undoubtedly of an economic nature. Because in human history, there has, hasn't been a great power which doesn't have economic power. Because if you don't have an economic power, you cannot have a military power. You cannot have military power. You cannot become a great power. Okay. In this respect, I think the key question concerns whether China can avoid the so-called middle income uh, trap in the next decade or so. Uh, World Bank estimates uh, suggest that 87 of the 101 countries that had belonged to the category of middle-income nations during the 1960s failed to advance to that of high-income ones by 2008. So 86% of failing rate, which is pretty high. Many studies also show that the growth rate of nations with per capita income ranging between $10,000 and $15,000, China hasn't entered into that yet, uh, tends to slow down, okay? So China will soon 
move into that category, once that happens, China's rate of growth will significantly go down. Of course, growth rate of China has been going down for quite some time. Facing a long list of widely reported problems in China, for instance, local government debts, real estate bubbles, a shadow banking system, omnipresent financial loopholes, not to mention high level costs and rampant overproduction, production, overcapacity uh, facilities. Will China manage to make herself an exception to this empirically proven curse? Okay. We don't know the answer yet. Okay. China has been talking about the goal of Bao Liu, maintaining the 6% growth rate. And I think we are not going to see that. A lot of people say 5.8% probably. Okay. There was a, a very interesting study done by uh, uh, staff at the Brookings Institution. Uh, they as, their estimate is about 4%. The real growth rate is 4%, not 6%. Okay. So only time will tell, tell. And again, this is only the first hurdle. The second hurdle on China's path to a great power is the two-city death trap, a concept that has become by now very uh, famous and familiar to you, uh, thanks to uh, Graham Allison and some other scholars. Adapted from the Greek epic, it delves into some structural conditions under which the system-leading nation is likely to engage in a war of hegemonic competition with the rising state, rising challenger. Based on the premise that power parity rather than power imbalance is the source of hegemonic competition, the two-city death trap offers near-perfect metaphor for Sino-American rivalry in the making. Of course, I have my own uh, view about the Graham Allison's book and the two-city death trap in general. Basically, two criticisms can be offered. There can be more than single one path to a war. And I think to see the death trap emphasizes as if there is one only single, single path to, to war. Second, I think to see the death trap is too much or excessively structural, thereby neglecting the role of agency and per perceptions. Okay. Now there is another puzzle here that is why in the world Beijing chose to break out of the long-held caste of strategic modesty in Chinese Tao Huang Yang Wei earlier than most experts had predicted. China got out of this caste of Tao Huang Yang Wei in early 2010s. What if China got out of this caste 15 years from now or 10 years from now, thereby attracting less attention of the international community while accumulating more power to herself. Why? That's a big puzzle to which I don't really have an answer. Some scholars say it was probably due to the lack of intragovernmental, that is interministerial coordination, let's say between the military between the Navy and the General Staff Department, and so on and so forth. I don't know. I don't have any empirical evidence to support that. And I don't think their studies also have very firm evidence to support that either. Okay? Or some other people also suggest that China might have miscalculated or misjudged America's decline because of the fiasco of the Lehman Brothers. I don't know might, because I never done interview with uh, uh, Chinese top leaders, so I wouldn't know uh, the mindset of their decision making. Now, regardless, the fact of the matter is that China is now more confident, more proactive, and more assertive, clearly succeeding in attracting America's full strategic attention for the better or for the worse. In the Central Foreign Affairs Conference held in July 2018, which is last year, first held first time since 2014, President Xi Jinping is alleged to have remarked that history is on China's side. And therefore, 
China must make good use of this strategic opportunity uh, to lead China onto the path to a great power. On another occasion, in December 2018, President Xi reportedly said that the first great transformation of world order uh, in 100 years is taking place. Obviously, he's referring to the possibility of hegemonic transition from the West and the US to China. In retrospect, a pertinent sign of China's ambition and aspiration was detectable back in 2015, May 2015. As some of you may recall, uh, US Secretary of State John Kerry visited Beijing, uh, had an audience with the uh, Chinese President Xi Jinping. And China's, uh, President Xi Jinping said to uh, uh, Secretary Kerry, the Pacific Ocean is vast enough to embrace both China and America. Actually, I think President Xi's remarks was well intended because there is a uh, old saying in China, there cannot be two tigers in one mountain. So he was actually re rebutting this Chinese uh, proverb saying that there is uh, much room for cooperation between China and the US. But then again, if you really think about it, you know, that remarks makes uh, President Xi Jinping the first, first foreign leader in the post-Cold War era who claimed half of Pacific Ocean uh, in front of very high level American uh, official. Okay. The to see death trap is not just about the enhanced probability of a hegemonic war because of the reduced power gap between the hegemon and the challenger but it also denotes a perceptual dimension where negative mutual views become another very important uh, source of conflict or even war. On a popular level, at least, this seems to be happening. According to the Pew Global surveys, in recent years since 2013, three things, three points are discernible. First, American views of China uh, have become much, much more negative. Okay. Second, American negative views of China surpass Chinese negative views of the US. So Americans are feeling more negative than Chinese feeling more negative than uh, about America. Finally, a third, more importantly, since 2017, that is the rise of the Trump administration, America's public general public's view of China are getting more closely aligned with the American government policy. Okay. Can I have what? There is another factor that prevents China from getting out of the two-city death trap too easily. Uh, that is um, the lack of commonalities. Okay. Commonalities can work as shock observer. Let's go back to the early 20th century, 100 years ago. Why did Great Britain view Germany as more of a threat than the US? Both were rising powers. But UK didn't view US as an enemy, but it did view Germany as an enemy. Why? Because UK, London, and Washington share so much in history, ethnicity, language, religion, culture, and world views. Okay. So many commonalities between the US and the UK. When it comes to finding a common denominator between Beijing and Washington, however, there is not much to speak of. And that is why, precisely, the US is so much alarmed by the fact that China is rising so fast. And in Washington's view, once on the top, China is likely to change the structure of vested interest, and so on and so forth. Therefore, US is more willing to contain, constrain, and even fight against China. Will China be able to find a way out of this intricate trap. That's the second hurdle. 
The third hurdle concerns what can be termed as the Kindleberger dilemma. Charles Kindleberger, uh, an IR scholar at Princeton University, posited the view that the chaos in the interwar period of the 1930s was created by Britain's inability as well as by America's unwillingness or unpreparedness to shoulder global financial responsibilities. The key implication of this argument is twofold. The world needs a capable hegemon to maintain stability and peace. And second, that hegemon must also be willing to use its resources to provide public goods. Given that America's relative decline has become a cliche, and uh, worse yet, Washington is becoming increasingly self-interested, if not overly introverted, will China instead be able to uh, fill the void? Let me give you some, some data. On the surface, China appears to have been spending an increasingly large amount of money overseas. According to A data, there's a data archive house at the William and Mary College, uh, College of William and Mary, the total amount of China's foreign spending amounted to $354 billion for the period of 2000 through 2014, while that of the US was $395 billion. Still, US is, spends more money than China, but the gap is being reduced. If calculated on an annual basis, including a few recent years, China is probably spending more than America. However, if these numbers are looked at more closely, of this huge amount being spent by China, only 22% is ODA, okay, official development assistance, while the remaining 78% spent on loans and investment in the private sector. The comparable figure for America's ODA was 93%, so 22 versus 93. So Washington is clearly more public goods oriented, if not purely altruistic. As you all, you all know, the China has long carried a split identity of being a big power on one hand and a developing nation at the same time. Okay. In the past, I think basically in the 90s up to the early 2000s, if you talk to Chinese scholars and even some officials, they took pains to differentiate between the two concepts of big power and great power, da guo and chang guo. You know? So their intention is to say that China is a big power, but it's not yet a, a, a strong power. But since the mid 2000s, you don't really see that anymore. Okay? Now, as I mentioned earlier, China takes for granted the fact that it is a leader, it is now a great power. So they now use the term interchangeably. Beijing still refuses to join G7, despite the fact that it got the invitation first time in 2004, because China doesn't want to be labeled as the advanced country. Okay? It still maintains the identity of developing nation. That's why it is so active in, G, uh, in the framework of G20. <clears throat> but China appears to prefer increasingly put on the hat of responsible great power by institutionalizing new international and multilateral frameworks like BRI and AIB to provide public goods for needy nations. Yet, being an altruistic giver is not as easy as it seems, since, as we talked about a little bit in, in one of the morning, morning session, criticisms and negative assessments of China's management of BRI and related financial resources are registered nearly everywhere, from Malaysia and Sri Lanka to Sierra Leone to Ivory Coast. Now let me move on to the uh, fourth hurdle. The fourth hurdle uh, is, in my term, the Nye paradox. Nye in Joseph Nye. Okay. Harvard, Harvard Kennedy School professor, he coined the term soft power in 1990. 
denoting the ability to appeal or co-opt by way of attraction and or shared values and standards. Once the book was published, the concept instantly caught the attention of many intellectuals as it underlined the voluntary will to follow without resorting to military or economic sanctions. Actually, no other country paid more attention to the concept of soft power than China. I still remember uh, on the Chang'anjie, there, there is a mega, mega uh, size bookstore called Tu Shu Da Xia. Uh, you know, about three or four stacks were filled with books on soft power, all written in Chinese. So some of them were translated, but at least for 10 years, you know, that bookstore continued to store books on, books on soft power. Not anymore, not anymore, but <clears throat> um, I think China uses the concept of soft power in two different uh, directions. One as a defensive measure of repudiating the China threat thesis on one hand, and on the other hand, as a proactive means of improving China's image overseas. Beijing has been spending tons of money on this. As you know, China established the English global television network, CGTN. Okay. And also, China is paying a lot of money in, uh, for the advertisement in very influential world-class newspapers like Washington Post. And of course, we all know that Confucius Institutes is another example. 540 Confucius Institutes worldwide as of 2018. As of this year, I think it should be like 520, reduction of about 20. If the Chinese government has had any meaningful success in its charm offensive, it was significantly undermined since 2009, and particularly since 2013. Now, I think from many corners of the world, China is seen as stepping on others' toes to advance her own interests only. With her ever-growing economic power, of course, many countries' increasing dependence on China for trade and investment, Beijing know where to hit. Okay? We call this sharp power. Beijing has been uh, retaliating uh, by hitting at the weakest points of each country uh, that is heavily dependent on China for trade and investment. Okay. Uh, of course, issues vary. It could be Dalai Lama, human rights, missile defense, Taiwan, South China Sea, Huawei, and what have you. Okay. It is not surprising that public opinions and perceptions of China the world over have declined in recent years. And I think a Pew Global Survey uh, has very nice data about this over the years. Nai paradox is a difficult puzzle for China to solve. For one, it concerns whether Beijing will be able to come up with sufficiently persuasive alternatives to such values as democracy, free market, and human rights as we know of them. Okay. China has been spending so much money and so much time doing research on coming up with alternative values and norms that can replace the so-called Western values, freedom, human rights, market, democracy. But I don't think China has been successful thus far. Okay. Of course, China has developed a very interesting and attractive sub-norm, such as uh, America's nuclear weapons doctrine, nuclear war doctrine is we can, Americans can uh, attack non-nuclear weapon states, and they can use nuclear weapons the first time. Okay. But China is different. China says we will never attack non-nuclear weapon state with no nuclear weapons. Of course, this is very appealing. But this is sub -known, not really on par with human rights, democracy. You know. So if, whether or not China can be successful in coming up with alternative values and norms of that level, that is the first uh, challenge. Another challenge is at what point and in what ways does Beijing have to strike a balance between the cultivation of soft power on one hand and the restrained use of sharp power 
to protect her interest. Will the ever complex domestic politics in the Zhongnanhai allow Xi Jinping and his key advisors such a luxury? I don't know. Furthermore, is Trump's full court press against China, which has been going on since 2017, going to offer enough room for such a balance? Of course, you know, it's easy to say that smart power is an answer. Smart power is a, a combination, combinatorial use of hard power and soft power, but smart power is very hard to come by. Now let me move on to the, the fifth and the final hurdle, which I term the yen problem. Okay. Yen, not in Japanese yen, but you will see soon what, what I mean by that. In the colonial period, for both economic and military reasons, empires were hungry for colonies around the world. Okay. We all know that. In the post-colonial era, superpowers maintained overseas bases and treaty allies to sustain their imperial reach. The United States currently boasts no less than 69 allies in order to sustain her forward defense posture and offshore balancing capacity. If China's geopolitical ambitions should remain within Asia, I don't think it will, but if China's geopolitical ambitions should remain within Asia, where China borders 14 countries, Beijing would probably not need an ally. China now has, legally speaking, one ally, that is North Korea. Okay. Whether or not China will really evoke the alliance beyond the legal stipulation, that remains to be seen. But, but if her aspirations aspiration should expand beyond Asia and aim for global hegemony, I definitely think enlisting a minimum number of loyal allies from different continents is a must. In fact, serious debates have been waged within China about this, and one most famous proponent for this is Yan Xuetong. That's why the Yan problem. Okay. Uh, Tsinghua-based IR scholar uh, who is a good friend of mine, by the way, uh, has been proposing that China must solicit allies, okay? without which China's ambition for, let's say, the China dream, or what have you, will never materialize. Of course, other than Yan Xuetong, Zhang Wenmu is another person who is proposing that. Some scholars go even so far as to suggest that China revive her security pact uh, with, uh, with Russia, okay? Although I'm not quite sure whether that is going to happen uh, for two reasons. China, at this point at least, doesn't want to change its principle of no alliance, okay? Second, Russia does not want to be a junior partner to the alliance, okay? Given the fact that China has been sticking with the no alliance principle since the 1960s, reversing this policy would require a draconian change with very far-fetching implications, okay? In other words, this would be the indicator whether or not China's geostrategic ambitions would go beyond Asia. If China changes policy on this front, I can assure you about 90% of the probability that China's ambition will go beyond Asia. Well, if you look at 1971-72, China did go through a tectonic change. You know, who ever thought about inviting Nixon to Beijing? Okay. There was a tectonic shift. And another tectonic shift took place in 2017. Does anyone know why 2017? Establishment of China's first ever overseas base in Djibouti in Africa. Of course, Chinese don't call it base. They call it uh, overseas supply facility. But basically the same thing. China has been criticizing 
US and Soviet Union for stationing their military forces on foreign soil for five, six decades. But now China has done it, okay? So there is no guarantee that China will not change its alliance policy either, okay? Now, let me move into a conclusion. Okay. Optimists would probably dismiss all these hurdles as easily surmountable. Okay. While critics might argue that China must first complete this large pile of difficult homework before she can claim a place among great powers, both in name and substance. Of course, pessimists have always enumerated Myriad domestic factors, ranging from the dictator's dilemma, local governance, ethnic protests, grassroots control, what have, what have you, as key impediments to China's eventual rise to great power status. However, ironically, these pessimists share much in common with the Chinese government's official position. That is, an aggressive and assertive foreign policy is out of the question due mainly to China's preoccupation with the domestic agenda. But if you look at the Soviet Union, Soviet Union has so many domestic problems, but they didn't prevent the Soviet Union from being an expansionist force, although short-lived. Okay. At this juncture, some of you might be wondering why I do not mention at all the democracy factor. As a matter of fact, I have mixed feelings about this. Uh, be, uh, that's why I wasn't so sure whether I had to uh, list this as the sixth hurdle. Okay? Three reasons. If you look at long human history, I don't know how many millennia, but if you look at that long history, democracy is a very new and recent phenomenon. If you look at Roman Empire, not a democracy. Tang Dynasty, not a democracy. Mongol Empire, not a democracy. Okay? So becoming a great power doesn't require democracy. Okay? I think there is certainly a, some sort of Western modernist uh, bias uh, in arguing that democracy should be a precondition for a great power. Okay? Second. Is democracy a guarantor of responsible power? Available evidence from the 20th century alone does not support that. I would say it pretty much is a hypocrisy supporting self-interest, nationalism, ACA, patriotism, and double standards of hegemonic state, be it UK or US or others. Okay. Third, the recent symptom, I don't, I don't know how many of you have read the uh, book that came out last year, How Democracies Die, written by Stephen Levitsky and, and uh, some other person. Very good book, How Democracies Die in the US, in other parts of the country. And I think, you know, elected officials become dictators using due processes. That is exactly what happened in Turkey, okay, and many other corners of the world. So um, the, the symptoms of dead or dying democracy uh, is, is probably an antinomy of the, the argument that uh, democracy is a precondition for a responsible great power. However, let me add, China can become a great power without democracy. But without democracy, China as a great power will not or may not survive very long. Okay. That, that is a possibility. I'm not saying it will happen, but that is a possibility. Okay. Now, finally, let us not forget that it is not just China that has tough homework to finish along these lines. Many of the traps, dilemmas, and paradoxes I have underlined are almost equally applicable to the US. Okay. Ample records suggest that many empires died from an overdose of conceit. 
then again, the history of the death of America is fairly long, just like the history of China's collapse. I stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you.